If you love the way Michelangelo's drawings look and you wish you understood what gets him this phenomenal sense of form, then this video is for you. I will demonstrate how to go about creating a master analysis of one of his drawings that isn't just a rote master copy, so you understand exactly what questions you should be asking and therefore answering with every single line in your own drawings to get to that same phenomenal sense of form in your work. If you're ready and excited for this lesson, be so kind and give it a thumbs up because like that other artists like you can find it in the algorithm as well. If you're new here, my name is Carolyn and I help artists who love to draw but who struggle in getting to that level of mastery and creativity that they've always hoped to get to one day. I myself am a practicing artist. I've been teaching artists for the past 15 years how to get to their next level of growth. So I hope you subscribe because like that you'll always get my latest videos in your inbox. Let's take a look at this beautiful drawing by Michelangelo and draw a careful master analysis of it. So notice I'm not saying a master copy because when we copy, we usually just go on autopilot blindly copying what we see. A master analysis invites us to be very thoughtful and critical of every single mark that we see and that will then lead us to the answers that will help us understand why a drawing is successful or not. So with this as our mode of operation, we also have to be aware of the principles that artists like Michelangelo are weaving together as they're orchestrating their drawings. So what are these principles? Those principles are things like gesture and major forms and how major forms connect, overlap, or intersect with each other. So right here, you're seeing me figure out how the major forms of the rib cage and the pelvis connect and or overlap with each other. So I'm using ovals and a center line and some landmarks to tease that out for myself on the side of the actual drawing. So I fully understand that the torso is slightly leaning at me and the hips are slightly tilting away from me and that I'm mainly seeing the side and the back and not so much on the right side of the back. Once I have that very clearly in my mind's eye, I go back to the actual drawing. The first few marks you saw me put down on the paper were not necessarily exactly the marks that Michelangelo himself put on the page, but they are the kind of marks that he will have at least had in his mind to create the gesture of the drawing. Now, if you've seen any of my previous videos, you know what a gesture is. If not, blending it in the top right, go and do some studying on what a gesture is, what the purpose is, what it basically is for, is to link up all the individual parts to create a unified and dynamic whole. Now to do this, I use a lot of flowy lines. Some of them are contour lines, but I'm trying to be a little bit more general at this phase. I'm not drawing all the little bumps along the outer edge. I'm just kind of grouping them together into rhythms that lead into each other. So if I had to speed it up and kind of boil it down in the top right corner there, you see me do a more distilled version of what the gesture actually is, right? It's just distilling it down into the rhythms connecting everything together. Now again, the key to a successful master analysis is to have a very clear focus on what it is that I'm trying to actually learn from this drawing. So my agenda for this drawing was to learn how Michelangelo gets his sense of form. So form is another way of saying three-dimensionality, another way of saying volume. For that, I first must understand the big underlying simple forms. So what you're seeing me do here is trying to figure out how the arms can be reduced down to cylinders and whether they're organized like in the top iteration of my drawing or in the bottom iteration of my drawing and how do they transfer from a cylindrical top to a more boxy bottom by the elbow or by the wrist. This is what I do on the side as I'm creating this master analysis so I can understand what was in Michelangelo's head as he was making his marks. So notice the marks I'm doing here. These are called cross contour marks. Marks are going across the volume. And so they're repeating the 
direction of what the opening of the cylinder is setting me up for, let's say. And so that is critical to have in your mind because depending on how the cylinder is oriented, those cross contours will be affected. So I need to understand this first, whether as a cylinder or as a box, because once I understand the simple forms, I can then organize my marks accordingly. So here I'm going in ellipsis essentially, but I could also make this into a more boxy version. And then I would just make my marks along with the top and bottom edges of the boxes. So you see how here now I'm making my hatch marks along with that plane of the box. Now let me slow down and explain what I just said again. Let's assume we have three different forms and they're all kind of similar. So they're kind of cylindrical, a little bit wider on the top, a little bit narrower at the bottom, like our arms or like our legs might be. But notice how they're all oriented differently. And I'm indicating that orientation with that central axis, this imaginary rod driving through these forms indicated here in red with the arrows. Now, you can have these imaginary simple forms, or you can even apply this thinking on the forms of the torso, let's say, where you have an egg form fused with a box form. So good draftsmanship is all about making marks that explain what the thing is like. And by understanding what the orientation of your forms are, that will help you make marks that explain that form better to the viewer. So when we shine a light on these forms, you don't just make random marks hoping to explain where there's light and where there's more shade. Now you can make marks that go with and across those volumes that make logical sense and reinforce what you're trying to convey. So in this part of the drawing, you see me do this process with the leg, where I'm thinking about what's the simple form. It's cylindrical on top, maybe a little bit more boxy towards the bottom. Notice now, as I'm considering the lighting situation with the light coming from the front left, that every plane that's angling away from that light, I am now indicating as shadow with marks that are echoing the top and bottom edges of this boxy cylinder. Now, that is a big form, the big volume. But what happens with the smaller lumps and bumps that we call muscles and bony protrusions that affect the surface? First, we need to see the big underneath because that will inform how we see the smaller forms on top. So here you can see me think about how this smaller lump can be represented by similar marks that are cross contour in nature as I was doing with a bigger form. So a cross contour, again, it's like this red line that kind of crawls across and over the volume coming up and out. And we don't want to make marks in our drawings that contradict these volumes. So let's come back to these simple cylinders and boxy cylinders from earlier on. So let's say this middle cylinder has like a dome-like pad sitting on top of it. And then this one here has also some sort of a more faceted looking lump. It kind of looks something like this, kind of like a narrow boxy situation that's attached to it. How do we represent these bumps, whether they're rounded or faceted, in a way where they reinforce the big forms that are underneath rather than contradict them. And so basically you want to make marks that are continuations of what you have already set up. So notice how I did these cross contours here in the middle that are basically just an extension of what I had set up for the underlying um, cylinder. And I'm not drawing the entire cross contour, just certain sections in a place where my little pad is fusing with the form. So for this more faceted little protrusion that I'm working on here, I'm thinking the same thing. Like if I was a little ant crawling across the cylinder and I came to this mm, kind of rocky lump, what path would I have to take to get across and over it? And so the marks that I make to indicate which of these sides are in light and which ones are in shadow are marks that are 
again mimicking the tops and bottom edges of these little planes. So to describe that we have a boxy forearm with a muscle on top of it, like here in the simplified version, we want to think about which planes and facets are angling away. That's where I'm putting my shading marks, my hatch marks that are organizing with the orientation of the plane. And I'm also thinking about how the actual lump is overlapping the bigger form, which creates a very clear contour. So coming back to the actual drawing, so here you see me in super sped up speed set up the foundation of this arm analysis. I am basically looking at the more specific shapes that I see there and I'm giving myself little um, placeholder shapes for all the bumps that I see. Now of course I can do these placeholder shapes fairly well because I'm aware of the underlying anatomy so it already looks familiar to me. If it's not familiar to you definitely watch next week's video where I talk about anatomy and studying that. But so what I have in my mind is the simple facets of the shoulder region. This is how that can be simplified where you have a front, a sideward facing plane and a backward facing plane as well as a top plane. And then we have even smaller um, forms that are sitting within that. And so every single mark that I am making and that I observed Michelangelo making his drawings are marks that describe these volumes. So here you can see me very slowly organizing every mark based on the facet I understand the lump to have. And so I'm giving cross contour or hatch marks, call them what you want, to the ones, to the planes that are angling away from the light source or that at least aren't reached as directly by the light source. We call this process form modeling, and I think it's a great term, especially thinking about the fact that Michelangelo was a sculptor as well. So he really understands how every part of our body has facets to it and how these facets either angle at the light or slightly away from the light or completely away from the light. So there's a certain logic that underlies all of the marks that we see in his work. Now there's one more thing I wanna tease out in this analysis for you. So when we're looking at the pelvis and the buttocks area, you wanna, again, think about what's the big underlying form here. So it's kinda of like this rounded box and we'll have the backward facing plane and the uh, underneath or downward facing plane that are in shadow. Now the thing that I wanted to tease out here is Yes, we need to be aware of those um, hatch marks or cross contour marks that we just discussed. And also a really useful thing to work on are the transitions from one plane to the other. Because those plane changes, those transitions from one plane to the other are great places to extra emphasize your cross contours. So that can be from the backward facing plane to the sideward facing plane, or it can be from the backward facing plane to the downward facing plane. So at those edges, we use those same hatch marks, but we emphasize them because that helps to turn the form. Now you wanna make sure that the planes are completely turned away from the light mass that they're darker than the planes are not quite as strongly angled away. So for example, if you look at the slight bumps along the outer hip, they're not completely turned to the back, they're just kind of angled backward. And so as I am making hatch marks indicating their facets, I am not allowing them to come become as dark as anything that's on planes that are completely facing away because those are technically the shadow masses and those smaller facets on the side of the hip are more like midtones. Now notice also what happens like underneath the arm there. So we basically are dealing with a cast shadow. So here I'm thinking of this little tube, casting a shadow over like an oval. That is that little line that we see underneath the arm they created there. So rather than just randomly copying that, I'm really thinking about, well, how do cast shadows behave and how do they kind of drape their way across the forms? Another way of just kind of reinforcing that volume that we see. 
So let's review what it is we want to distill out of our master analysis drawing when we're interested in form. Number one, gesture. How are all the forms linked together? Number two, what are the big underlying forms and how are they behaving and how is the light affecting them? Number three, how are the smaller lumps and bumps arranging over those bigger forms and what kind of cross contour hatch marks do I need to employ to get that point across? And to figure all these things out, I can do this on the side of my drawing, not just on the finished drawing itself. So you see how this isn't just a master copy where you blindly copy what you see in front of you. You're actually learning to understand why certain marks are on the page in the way that they are. And like that, next time your own drawing can become infused with this understanding. Now, if you enjoy these in-depth lessons and you wish you could have more and you wish you could have a mentor holding your hand while you're walking through your next level of growth, be sure to check in the description below because there you can find out how to work with me in my very own online mentoring program. There's a free masterclass you can access which will answer some of the questions of what it's like to work with me. And I would be honored to see you in the future in my program.